Hello there, I'm Chris Anderson. Welcome to the TED interview. Today, I want to take us back to a story that some of us may have forgotten. The incredible youth climate movement of 2019, led by Greta Thunberg. I think that in many ways, that movement changed the future irrevocably. It put a bug inside millions of truly influential people's minds about what they simply had to do. Now then, there's been this pandemic and uh, it's grabbed a lot of our attention this past year. But while we were worried about that, there were still millions of youth around the world building a truly powerful global movement. Today, I'm sharing a conversation with one of them, Gia Bastida. Gia has been called America's Greta Thunberg, uh, but in many ways they couldn't be more different. Gia was born in a small town outside of Mexico City, is of indigenous Otomi heritage. And she comes to this issue with a focus on climate justice, not just bringing down emissions globally, but doing it in a way that affects people fairly. She's going to tell us the story behind the biggest climate march the world has ever seen, and how an event like that helps shift the cultural zeitgeist. And I think more than that, even, she really gives us a picture of what the future looks like through her eyes. So, you know, in the season that's focused on optimism, or at least looking for the case for optimism, it's young women like her that are persuading so many adults that they just have to do something different. And that is how change happens. It's when a critical mass of people decide they're going to act. So as you listen to her, Shia, think about what are the seeds of change? How the passion and the energy and the determination of a group of young people may well have done the critical work of changing the agenda and making a genuine response to climate feel both possible and actually essential. So, here is Shia. Shia, welcome. Thank you for having me. I am curious what it takes for an 18-year-old woman to become passionate about climate, about an issue that for many would seem distant and uh, non-relevant. Tell me your story. Well, I think my story really starts with the generations before me, my parents, my grandparents, their relationship with the earth, learning about reciprocity, learning about loving what loves us. So I was raised that way by my dad, who is Otomi, which is an indigenous group in central Mexico. And it's actually something that he retook. There was this shame to being indigenous. But right now, we're kind of breaking that, right? We're taking pride in our indigeneity. So that's what my dad did. He learned the language. He learned the traditions. He traveled to learn about his culture. And he brought it back to where he lived. So that's how he raised me. Tell me about some of those traditions that, that spoke to you, that were meaningful to you. Well, some of the most important ones are like spiritual more than anything. So sweat lodges, going in and really being with the ground, with the earth, with the fire and the steam that comes out of sweat lodges. So that's really special. We also have ceremonies pretty often where my dad thanks the four directions and the sky and the earth. So, you know, those are some of the things that make you feel really connected and make you more aware of everything around you. And one of the stories that I can tell you is, you know, the connection to the lake in my in my town. So especially in my town, we were we used to be a town of fishers and we got everything from our lake and our river. And Mexico City started extracting water in the 1940s. And obviously the Mexico City population has grown exponentially. So they need a lot of water that they're taking from our aquifer. And so my town has been drying up year by year since then. So drying dry, up. Yeah, hmm. drying up. 
And because of that, my town gets free water. Like we like we get it every week, but sometimes we don't get it. It's not reliable, like our access to water. So after having built this really deep connection and this weird relationship with water, my town did get flooded when I was 13 years old. So that was really weird for us because we had been experiencing water scarcity. So all of a sudden, there's this big wave of nonstop rain and our river was overflowing. And our river is one of the most polluted rivers in Mexico because of factories and waste What was your experience of that flood as a a 13-year-old? It was the day before I was leaving to New York. My uh, suitcase had been ready for like two weeks because I was really excited. And that day I told my best friend that I was leaving. I hadn't told her. And so she was at my house and we had to drive her out of the town to go leave her with her mom. And we couldn't because there was just water up to our knees. The car couldn't go by. So we had to cross all of it. And people were, because my town now is a town of furniture. So people were trying to save their furniture that they had made. And so much of it ended up ruined. And the most of the town, which is like 10,000 people, rely on that business. And you, was, you came to believe that that flood was caused by, that that was the climate change ef- effect? Yeah. Mostly because my grandmother told me that had never happened in her eight years of life. And also because Mexico had just come out of the biggest drought in 70 years. Were you already at that stage as a girl? Were you already interested in the climate issue or or did that happen after your move to New York? Um, I think I was aware of it, but I, I wasn't thinking about speaking up, I was thinking, I'm going to learn good English. I'm going to come back and go to a good high school here. And my dad always told me that that brought opportunities because you could go across the world and speak at conferences. And that's like my dad's favorite thing to do. He knows seven languages. So my thoughts weren't there at all, but my parents both studied sustainable development. So they were both trying to save actually our our lagoon from being polluted. So I've always been surrounded by, by my parents doing a lot of academic work and field work about it. So you arrived in New York, age 13. Uh, Within two years, you were a a, a full-on climate activist. How on earth did that happen? What was it that got you engaged in the issue and convinced you that you could actually play a part? So what really happened was that I had just left my town shocked that it was flooded and I had no idea why. And arriving to New York, we went to my godfather's house and he drove us around and showed us what Hurricane Sandy had done. And it was just so, it hurt, you know, to see entire houses and businesses just wiped out. Hurricane Sandy had happened, I think, in 2012, and that was 2015. So it had been three years and people hadn't been able to rebuild yet. So all of these things, um, I guess it was the moment of realization of this is already happening. This is a global issue. And for me, really, it's affecting communities Uh, that are, you know, poor the most, marginalized the most. Like, I was checking in with my grandma. There was no aid for my town. There was no plan to rebuild, to clean up, to help people. So it was also this issue of injustice for me that I started seeing. And coming to New York opened my eyes to a lot of injustices, uh, starting with, for example, the school system and how segregated it is in New York. So it was like a lot of things coming together that's made me ask questions to my dad. What's happening? Is this what you've been doing your whole life? And that's when he said, I'm going to give your name for a conference in Malaysia. So um, my first conference was at 15 years old in Malaysia. And that was the first time I ever spoke in front of adults. So I was like, okay, I went by myself for two weeks at 15 And that was the first time I ever stood in front of adults and said, we need more climate education. That I said, we need to listen to indigenous voices. That I said, the climate crisis is happening right now. And just seeing their faces when I, when a 15 year old told them the same thing that a bunch of other people had told them probably the same day, it made me realize that there's also a generational injustice aspect to this. And that when a kid talks about the climate crisis, it is perceived different than when somebody else does. 
Mm. So over the next couple of years, you just got more and more involved in this this issue and became part of the movement that uh, organized these youth strikes from from school. Talk about that, how that happened and and how amazing the year of 2019 ended up for all of you. Yeah, I mean, 2019 is my favorite year in the in the history of years. Um, and so far, so, so far, so yeah. far. <laughs> yeah, so coming back from Malaysia, I felt really inspired to make a difference. And that is really abstract. How do you make a difference? So I joined my environmental club. It was not what I was expecting. It was more like a hanging out club and watching documentaries club. People said like, we need to make a school-wide day of no plastic straws or something like that. And I was like, if that's the cap of our power as kids. So I started organizing the club to be more politically active because I thought that was the way to go. So we went upstate to Albany, talking to our politicians. I testified at City Hall about why we need climate action in the city and climate justice in the city. And, you know, I encountered a lot of politicians in that time who all talked to me and thanked me and said, it's so good that you're doing this. But then I saw their platforms and they were never more ambitious than before we came to talk to them. And that is when Greta called for the first global climate strike in March 15th, 2019. So I decided I was going to organize my school. Obviously, I didn't have the resources to organize the whole city. So I put up posters every single day that were taken down every single day, even after talking to the administration. Um, I was going to different classrooms every Friday to invite people to the strike. We couldn't advertise skipping school because that's like not allowed. So all the posters that I put up said, check this Instagram page. And in the Instagram page that I created, I put the time really clearly. Meet at the lobby at 12. Meet at the lobby at 12. It's like people knew that was that was the, what was most important, that the word was going around. I didn't have to talk to 600 people. I just had to talk to three very gossipy people. And then it just spread. And that day, March 15th of 2019, um, 600 kids from my school walked out, which is amazing. So on that day, it, you, you, I mean, it sounds like you were really surprised at the overall impact. And just, just what was that feeling? That must have been a, an exhilarating feeling, seeing that it, it wasn't just your school, it was many, many others were, were sort of joining forces here. Yes, so it was 5,000 kids, which, you know, self-organized. And, you know, it was just amazing. First, because I didn't expect that many kids to show up, but... They're, second, because realizing that the reason why they showed up was because somebody gave them the opportunity to do it. That if you give somebody who knows about an issue the opportunity to take action and you give them actionable steps to make their voices heard, they will. So it just made me realize that I was not the only crazy kid who was thinking about climate. It, it was like many of us who were thinking about it in the back of our minds, even if that was not our first priority. And seeing so many kids so passionate, like, you know, walking up, marching out, walking out, screaming out our chants so passionately. It just, every time there's a strike, I feel like re-energized by everybody's energy. And we marched from Columbus Circle to the Museum of Natural History. And that was our march, you know, very short. It was like 20 blocks probably. But it felt like we walked the whole city. It felt like everybody was looking at us. It felt like we were making history. I, I've never had a biggest smile. Like I was just so happy <laughs> about everything that we were able to do. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's where I met all of the other, every like few kids, couple kids who organized their own school at the major schools, we got together. We were like, who are these people who were organizing in the other schools? And we created Fridays for Future New York City from the leaders of each school. Mm. And then it continued to build momentum. What happened after that? We uh, started having weekly meetings, in-person weekly meetings, with all of the youth who wanted to organize in the city. And we had from 50 to 80 youth in the same space every single week organizing, leading up to September 20th. And it felt like a job. Like every day we would meet, with our computers in an office, make calls. Like organizing is making calls, making partnerships, getting money, getting the sound, 
uh, system, right? Getting in contact with city, with the city, getting in contact with the parks. So that was what we were doing all day and uh, printing thousands of posters that we would put all over the city and we would go on subway carts and sing like, we're going to strike for life and everything we love, we're going <laughs> to... What was your contact with uh, Greta Thunberg during this process? So I think that one of the most exciting parts was that through all of the organizing and what kept us pushing was that she was coming on a boat across the Atlantic. And I feel like right now we kind of forget about that, but that was the main story for those two weeks. So that expectation that she was coming was really awesome. And then we met her when she arrived. Um, And I've never seen so many cameras in my entire life. Hmm. At the same time, and a radio station that worked with me in the past called me and I was like, yeah, she's coming, I see her. So there were so many things going on at the same time. Plus the expectation of the massive strike that was going to happen all around the world. So tell me what happened on September 20th. Did it feel like this was a piece of history being made here? 100%. On the day of September 20th, you know, I woke up really early. It felt like a Christmas morning. Like you were really excited to wake up and you couldn't uh, keep sleeping. You know, we had told everyone where to meet, Folly Square. And I am arriving to Folly Square with my family. My, both my parents came with me. And I remember getting there like an hour or two hours before we, we told people to come. And it was already full. And I was hugging all of my friends. And it just felt like we did it. Like, we're here. It's happening. We've prepared so long for this moment. And it all started with a land acknowledgement by Lenape people. And then we led the march. They just opened the space for us. Like, all the police that were there opened the space for us. And the most exciting part that I remember the most was walking down Wall Street and the, the pavement was just rumbling and the sound of the chants was bouncing off of the buildings and you could feel the power, you could, you could feel the excitement and the energy and change. I, I, that sounds a little cliche, but you could feel that change was here, that it, it wasn't coming, it was already here. We prepared for 16,000 people to 20,000 people like, that's what our permit was for, 16 to 20,000 people. And when we look at the news and it says that a helicopter counted 300,000, we just couldn't believe it. It was hmm. absolutely insane. And, and around the world that day, like, millions of people were, were part of this movement. How would you describe the impact of those protests that year? Um, so... I mean, the first thing to note is also that, like you said, it was happening around the world. So when I was going to sleep, it started in Australia. Australia was the first country to do it. And I think they had like 80,000 kids in Australia. And I was like, how are we going to top that, you know? But at the same time, it was like, we're all in this together. And at the end of that, of September 20th and September 27th, we counted over 7.6 million people around the world. And... Looking back and in that moment, I do believe that a spark was ignited, a spark that we hadn't felt before, even if we had already been organizing uh, for a long time. It just felt like everything that was supposed to happen was happening and that change was happening faster. Like it felt like for a while it had been happening really slowly and it was about pushing it and pushing it. And that this time it just let itself happen. And what I mean by that is that I feel like every single person who attended it and watched it felt like they had a personal responsibility. And of course, our goal is systemic change. But for every person to feel like their own profession can be turned into activism is what our goal was. That every person felt like whatever they were good at, they could use it to speak for the climate movement and you know, for solutions for the climate crisis. So let's let's um, think about this for a sec, because it's, it's interesting how, <laughs> how does the world change? You know, like a skeptic could say, great, you know, so a bunch of kids went on a march during a day or two in September um, and uh, were moved by it. Uh, 
big deal. The world's now continuing on as usual. You know, the oil wells are still spewing out oil. Industry is still pumping away. People are traveling. You know, where's the change? Like, I can think of at least two different ways where you could really imagine change happening. One, I think you just hinted at this, of um, the intensity of that experience of thousands and thousands of people marching together. Like, it's clear from what you're saying, you know, you never forget that. And and so this issue is always going to be part of your life. Like, I, I wasn't actually marching that day. I was I was in awe watching what was happening. And it seemed to me that there was a real shift in a lot of people's minds at that time. I, I wonder whether you've, you've had stories of that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it goes as specifically as that in individual families, maybe you've got kids who are passionate, they're a part of this strike. You've got parents who maybe are in business and doing something, and they just decide that they are going to be part of the solution. I think there was a lot of sort of, you could call it what you want, call it shaming, call it sort of waking up, call it, um, call it just a tipping point mm -hmm. that created a kind of critical mass towards change. And, and the reason why that's not as crazy as it sounds is that so many things in the world, and, and especially in business, depend on things reaching a kind of critical mass. Like usually someone wants to change something and they go, yeah, that's a good idea, but it won't work because no one else will agree to it. Suddenly, if people believe actually other people might agree to it, then it changes their own opinion on it. Part of me thinks that that happened that day, that, that a kind of tipping point was reached. D do you think there's some truth to that? And do you have any, any stories of that from your peers, of, of change that they saw in their families or in their connections? I mean, I think you're absolutely right. You know, there's statistics that come out that, that say most of the business owners who have shifted their practices is because their kids told them to. And I, I think that that's one of the most interesting things about this being led by kids, that a kid is also part of a whole family and a whole family that can change and a whole family that ha is a stakeholder in whatever area they're part of. You know, when I went to COP25, a reporter asked me, why do you think you can come in here and change what we have been talking about for the past 25 years? Why do you think you can just do that? You're so naive. We were in a press conference and there were like five of us and all of us were shocked because, you know, before that we had just been receiving like normal questions about what, what's your strategy next and how do you communicate to people and what do you want to see? What are your demands? And all of a sudden we had this person talking to our face that we had just only seen online about how we are not going to get anything done and we are just kids playing, saving the world. And I told her, you know, we are running against time now more than ever. And that type of deadline for us as kids who want their kids to have joy in their lives, as kids who want to be parents or not, as kids who have been growing up in a world that has been taken away from us in front of our faces, just the fact that you put a deadline on us and that we can do something about it is an opportunity that not many other crises have. Well, indeed, I mean, that the, um, the climate crisis is mostly about the sort of medium-term future. There are bad things happening now, but um, the really bad things that could happen are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years away, which means that the younger you are, the more stake you have in this crisis. If you have decades to live, like that, that's a card that you can play uh, and it's, it's actually very powerful. And I think it's what, it's what persuades a lot of adults. And I think that was a, a big part of the aha moment of, you know, this is about the lives of the people we love. And um, we, we had better start taking it more seriously. So, so, so there's a sense in which you, you have a deeper right than those of us who are older to talk about this issue. Is that fair? I mean, I feel like that's the first thing we all believed as a movement. Our messaging was, you have failed us, you have stolen our future, which was pretty aggressive for me, and I didn't really like that messaging. And it was at the same time that I realized, you know, we are at the most stake as youth, but we are also the least able to do something about it. 
we are not business owners. We don't have any capital. We don't have completed our education. All we have is our parents and the media, maybe. You can say they're, they were pretty uh, covering us a lot around the world. It's really about all of the people who are stakeholders changing uh, their practices. And it feels weird that people ask you, what do you do about it? And you, you say... I mean, I organize strikes from school. Like, I can't do anything else. I I started a nonprofit uh, where I educate other youth about the issue. But I'm thinking about somebody who is an adult who invests in the fossil fuel industry and says, I stopped investing. That just seems like such a much bigger change to me. If you are the owner of a natural gas rig and you say I stopped the production of, of natural gas and I shifted to renewables to power the power grid like that just seems like such a bit much bigger change to me so I just feel like the magnitude of change that can be done by adults considering everything that like you have is much more impactful than any that we can make as use so that's why it's so important for us to speak to adults. I've heard uh, several examples of exactly those stories in the last weeks and months of people who, whose careers were in the fossil fuel industry and who were persuaded, basically, by their daughters to change and to, to, try to use their skills and resources in a different direction. Um, in this case, geothermal uh, was the was the path they took, and I, I think at one level it sounds sort of bleak if you're if you're if you're a kid and you feel you have no power, but in another way, I mean, all human societies are anchored by their kids. I mean, the, you know, the joy most people's joy in life, a huge part of it is in ensuring that their kids have a good life. You know, how many times you've heard, "Oh, I just want them to be happy." Well. So, 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 so there's huge power in saying you want us to be happy. Well, then think for a minute about what the future will actually be and what the consequences are. are. It's, it's, it, it's an interesting, almost um, tactical decision on your part as to how aggressive to get. I'm curious how much that that has been a debate. Have you have you disagreed with your peers about this? Are you in danger of missing a trick by not being more aggressive? How how? T- tell me more about your thinking about this, about how to almost tactically get the most out of our, our generation, um, where to be on that aggression level. Yeah, so, I mean, at the time it was really popular. It was just like a meme, and memes go all the way around the world. You know, the OK Boomer um, meme. And, you know, when I looked at it and when I saw some of my peers you said, I was like, we can't divide ourselves at a point where all we need is unity. And that sounds also like I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm really cliche in a lot of the other things that I live by. But it did change, at least in the spaces that I was part of. It kind of shifted the conversation to how best do we tap into not only older generation, but also companies and organizations that we thought we couldn't tap into because we were just completely not willing to work with them. So it not only changed the conversation as to intergenerational work, but intersectoral work. And I think that was really important because, first of all, before when we used to talk to adults, I feel like they would feel not only a little scared to talk to us and being shamed by us, but also a little sad that they couldn't be part of the solution themselves so when we shifted that that was actually the main one of the main themes for september 20th that we didn't want only kids to strike so the people who strike the seven million people we said it's an intergenerational strike everyone is invited and everyone is needed that was our motto for that one everyone is needed so the way i see it now is we have a goal that we need to meet and we need everyone to do their best to get there. And once the conversation becomes, we are united against the common enemy of what might happen, there is a lot more imagination as to how to stop that. And there's a lot more innovation and it feels more actionable 
from me. Shia, you, you talk a lot about and you work a lot on issues of climate justice. Um, talk about what you mean, first of all, by climate justice. The basics of climate injustice is that the climate crisis will hit disproportionately around the world. You know, islands are going to be gone before it gets to continents. There's areas that are more polluted than others. So how do we mitigate that is climate justice. How do we have solutions that address these issues is climate justice. For example, when you think about we're becoming less reliant on coal, so there's a lot of coal workers who are, you know, becoming jobless. And when you think about those workers and their families and their income, climate justice is giving those workers another chance in another industry, training them for another industry preferably the renewable energy industry. So that's what we mean by justice. How do you take care of the people who have sadly been part of the problem but want to be part of the solution and they t didn't have an option of whether they wanted to be impacted or not? It feels like it, it can be um, confusing sometimes for people who who feel that sense of injustice. They feel that the climate crisis is mainly felt by certain groups, as you've said. But some people's response to that is to say, therefore, our focus needs to be to act now to help those specific groups. Others' response is just wanting to redouble efforts on solving the problem of just reducing emissions to avoid even greater injustices happening down the road. Is there any kind of... Um, tension there in, in terms of the priorities that you would want people to focus on? Or is it just, do we have to do all of the above? I think that whatever calls you, you should, you know, do follow that. But my problem is when people who have awesome carbon trading technologies, for example, where you say, oh, like, let me get on a plane, but I can offset my carbon. And it's offset by planting trees in the Amazon that might not be native trees or, you know, things like that. So when we talk about all of the solutions that we are seeing, my question is, do whatever you feel like you can make a difference in, but are you making sure that your solution is not causing more problems? And if it's not, go ahead, even if it's not solving injustices. But if it's perpetuating injustices, we're just going to take longer getting out of them. It's about how are we actually not just finding loopholes and short-term solutions and band-aid solutions. Is your solution actually going to be here for the long run and in a sustainable way? Which, which brings me to a, a key question. What is the role of business in, in this? You know, it's clear that business is a huge part of the problem has been. Most of the CO2 that has been emitted at some point comes down to a product made by a company. And so is business simply the evil that has to be fought? Is, is capitalism the sort of the plague that brought us here and we have to take out? Or must business be part of the solution? What do you think is the wise way to think about that issue? So I think that everything you said is true. Like, the way I feel about capitalism is that we are relying on finite resources for infinite projected amounts of growth. And the way that I think things should work is in a cyclical cycle. That's how I was raised. Uh, how do we work in cycles so that things are regenerative, so that things are building up on each other, so that things are not running out. So I feel like my take on capitalism is very philosophical, is that we cannot just keep trying to grow exponentially because then what is our goal? In this case, like we are talking about capital and money, but 
is that fulfilling for humanity? No, it's not. Is that fulfilling for your spirit? No, it's not. So, you know, I think businesses have to be part of the solution because they are people running those businesses and people have decisions to make. And those decisions can be ethical or not and in the right direction or not. And we are the consumers who drive demand. We are the consumers who can choose where to put our demand. So I do believe that there's like, it's a both sides kind of thing with a common goal that we all have to be aware of. So we've had we've had um, good debates on many of these topics with people like Kate Rayworth, um, Andy McAfee and so forth. I mean, to me, the debate about business and about capitalism generally is the extent to which it is capable of dematerializing or certainly decarbonizing. Um, some things can grow indefinitely, I think. Creativity, human creativity, like there's, I think there's no depth to the amount of knowledge that humans could learn and take delight in. And so, yes, if um, the future business is sucking ever more products out of the earth, and especially if it involves putting a heating blanket around our planet, it, 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 if, if that was all capitalism could do, it would definitely have to go. So the debate is, how can your generation help change the incentives of business leaders and consumers and everyone to want different things that this huge global machine churns out? You know, in my idealistic days, I, I see, you know, you have a knowledge economy, you could picture a world where there's ever more, more and more resources go into just different forms of creativity. And, um, and in the meantime, if you've got a giant problem to solve, like solving the climate crisis, you know, business is the, is the only thing we have that can scale to actually do that. And so hopefully we could find a way of purposing it to do that. And, and it's what's so exciting to me about part of what y you and your peers have done is that you've changed the rules of business. Like you've made it unacceptable for business leaders to do things that 10 years ago they, they could do more and more. I would say a critical mass of business leaders and the investors and so forth who invest in them believe now that they have to be part of building a sustainable future, which is why it's so, it's so exciting to hear you, Jean, and uh, so many stories over the last couple of years that have shown this sort of shifting opinion that, that makes it possible to dream of that we actually could do this. I mean, how do you feel about, you know, we had this year of the pandemic, quite apart from the horrible experience of it, was it a crushing disappointment to the movement that you kind of lost the front page for a bit. It played out differently across the world. Um, but I know that personally, what I did is I knew that we couldn't strike for Earth Day, which was something that all of us were looking forward to. We wanted that to be bigger than September 20th. So our ambition is still there and our goals are still growing. You know, the climate movement, the youth climate movement is still here uh, very much working every single day. I think that, like you said, what's shifted is that we don't have the front page. Uh, we can't have the front page visually. It's hard for us to organize any action that is eye-catching. There is nothing that's going to compare to millions of kids walking out of school. But at the same time, it gave us so many learning opportunities about communication, about accessibility, about countries that can't strike. So how do we include them in our activism? We do feel the, the heaviness of trying to do the most you can, that we realized that we had to take care of ourselves and give space to other people to do all the work as well. So it taught us a lot, I think, and we can't wait to come back stronger. <laughs> so tell me, Jie, how you are thinking about the future. Um, like, how, how clear a picture do you have of how the next 10, 20, 30 years might play out? Are you hopeful? Are you, do you feel despair? Where, where's your head? I mean, I feel really optimistic about the future just because I know the people who I work with and I know what we are capable of. So that's like the good future. The future that I want is a future where you know, in 10 years, I can have a kid and I'll be happy about it. And I can show my kid my town in Mexico and I can show my kid 
like a beach, something that might be underwater in 20 years. You know, I feel like beaches are really interesting because they do take thousands of years to form and they can take a few years to just be gone. Um, so I just want those little things to be possible. So, you know, the, the bad feature for me is it's really chaotic, I think. It's really messy. It's really sad. It's climate refugees. It's more hurricanes. And I am on the side where I really want to be a mom. So I probably still will have kids, but I know so many teenagers who are my age who are saying, I, I'm not going to have kids because look at the world. And that is just so sad to me that people say, look at the world, I can't bring a kid here. And I just want that to be the complete opposite. And for me, it's just unacceptable to even think about that future. I just know it's it would not be pretty. And I don't think any of us want that. And I don't think any of us want to feel a little bit responsible for that. Um, and if there's something that I do know is that our actions, you know, what you do right now is what's going to dictate tomorrow. And all of us have that choice. You know, we, I, I often invite people just to plant a bug in people's heads. If, if you could plant an idea in the minds of, say, the generation older than, than you, what, how do we need to rewire how we think about the future? I would love to say everybody needs to be a climate activist, which would be the easy thing to say. But I think that all of us need to be aware of how everything affects each other. So how the climate crisis makes uh, issues of gender inequality worse in some countries, how the climate crisis can make environmental racism more acute, how the climate crisis can just, you know, make more people poor and disenfranchised and when you know that saying that that's like live your life like this was your your last day I feel like that's how I want everyone to live their lives not like it's your last day but like I feel like the true meaning of that saying is do the best you can every day and if the best you can do for the world is take your grandkids to the beach so that they get inspired about the beauty of the world and do that. If the best thing you can do is go to work and say, we need a sustainability officer. You know, whatever it is that you put your mind to and you can do for the movement, do it. Because I feel like we do have this debate in the movement that individual actions don't count as much as systemic change. But the thing is that systemic change is not gonna happen unless there is enough people doing individual actions. And it's something that feeds each other. So even if it's for you to feel better about what you're doing, do those little things and, you know, change the world with us. Gia, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for your work and for your optimism um, and for the hope you've brought me in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So that was Shia Bastida. To learn more about Shia's latest efforts, check out her Re-Earth initiative at reearthin.org. That's R-E-Earthin dot org. The TED interview is part of the TED Audio Collective, a collection of podcasts dedicated to sparking curiosity and sharing ideas that matter. This show is produced by Kim Nedefin Peterser and edited by Grace Rubenstein and Sheila Orfano. Sam Baer is our mixer, fact checked by Julia Dickerson, and special thanks to Michelle Quint, Colin Helms, and Anna Phelan. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>